Diagnosing facet-related neck pain. How good is the clinical exam? We all use standard testing for common problems in practice, but as we've seen over the last decade, many of these procedures had not been tested for reliability or validity. Now many tests, once thought to be of value, have been demonstrated to be of little value, especially when interpreted as a single test. Groups of tests often do better, especially if all tests in that group produce a positive or provocative response. These clusters of tests are often called clinical prediction rules or, more recently, clinical prediction guides. Even though facet pain is one of the most common problems seen by chiropractors and manual therapists, the value of the common tests used has not been evaluated for true value using studies that compare to a gold standard. A new study attempts to compare the results from standard clinical exam procedures with the results of facet joint nerve blocks. A quick review of facet innervation. Remember that deeper structures are innervated by the sinovertebral nerve, also called the recurrent meningeal nerve. Facet joints are innervated by nerves that allow more localization, the medial branch of the posterior primary rami. Here we can see other innervated structures, including the periosteum of the posterior arch and deep muscles and ligaments. We see that the lateral branch is for superficial muscles and skin. The purpose of the study we are about to review is to identify those individuals who more likely have facet-related neck pain, who have not responded to conservative care, and who might benefit from nerve block itself or other minimally invasive medical procedures. The intent is to narrow down the individuals who are referred for a facet block, which is often used as an intermediate step prior to more invasive procedures. In other words, if someone is suspected of having facet-related pain, referral for a diagnostic nerve block using anesthetic to determine relief at a specific segmental level is considered diagnostic for facet pain and may identify an individual who will respond to either a nerve block or to the more invasive and expensive medical interventions of neurotomy or rhizotomy. So what are these minimally invasive techniques? They involve the use of radiofrequency ablation therapy using heat to destroy the nerve, in this case the medial branch of the posterior primary rami. The name of the procedure is facet neurotomy or facet rhizotomy. Local anesthetic is used and under the guidance of fluoroscopy, the surgeon advances a cannula to the facet joint. The correct localization is tested by injecting a small amount of dye under fluoroscopic observation to determine probe location or sending in a small electrical pulse to the nerve in an effort to reproduce the patient's pain. If positive, localization is deemed correct and radiofrequency heat is used to ablate or destroy the nerve. So how common are nerve blocks? In a large sample of Medicare patients, Manchikanti et al. reported that 317,220 cervical and thoracic facet joint blocks were performed in 2011. That's a 359% increase from the year 2000. There is some caution, though, for using nerve blocks as a diagnostic gold standard. Single diagnostic blocks result in a high false positive rate ranging from 27 to 63%. The recommendation is to use two nerve blocks using a particular protocol to better assure validity of these results. The title of the study we will review is Derivation of a Clinical Decision Guide in the Diagnosis of Cervical Facet Joint Pain, published in the Archives of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation in 2014. The exam procedures utilized and compared to diagnostic nerve block in this study were range of motion, palpation for segmental tenderness, the extension rotation test, and a manual spinal examination. Although range of motion, palpation for segmental tenderness, and the extension rotation test are somewhat self-descriptive, what was used for the manual spinal exam in this study? Patients were prone, and the examiner directed posterior to anterior pressure at the articular pillars of each segmental level performed on both the right and left sides. When moderate or marked restriction was noted with an associated increase in pain, local or referred, the test was considered positive. The patients were individuals referred for facet joint blocks between the ages of 18 and 65 who reported neck pain intensity greater than 3 out of 10 for a minimum of 3 months. 
The exclusion criteria were standard, including those with cervical radiculopathy, upper motor neuron disease, infection, neoplasm, fracture, uncontrolled diabetes, pregnancy, workers' compensation, or ongoing litigation. Outcome measures utilized were the Neck Disability Index, the Pain Catastrophizing Scale, General Health Questionnaire, and the Leeds Assessment of Neuropathic Symptoms and Signs Pain Scale. After obtaining results from the clinical exam, individuals were sent for comparative medial branch blocks. These were performed on two occasions with two different anesthetics to reduce the high false positive rate associated with a single block procedure. Injection was with either 0.5 milliliters of bupivacaine or lidocaine under fluoroscopic guidance. The anesthetics were delivered in a random order to minimize measurement bias associated with the order of delivery of the anesthetics. A positive response was defined as at least 80% decrease in neck pain for at least the duration of the anesthetic used, which was one hour for lidocaine and three hours for bupivacaine. And a subject was deemed to have facet joint pain if they experienced a positive response to both medial branch blocks. So which joints were most frequently injected? In other words, which joints had the most positive responses on clinical examination? Well, at C5, C6, it was 36% of patients, at C6, C7, 33% of patients, and at C2, C3, 23% of patients. Out of the 125 subjects, 52 had positive responses to the blocks, which was a 42% pretest probability or prevalence. Now, which joints had the most positive responses to injection? Well, out of the 52 patients, at C5, C6, 21 had relief, at C2, C3, 13, at C3, C4, 12, at C6 and 7, 11, and at C4, C5, 4. So based on this study, what is the best combination? The strongest odds ratios were found with a palpation for segmental tenderness followed by the manual spinal exam, and then the extension rotation test. Testing positive on all three clinical tests gave a likelihood ratio of 4.94, and the post-test probability of a diagnosis of facet joint pain increased from 42% to 78%. If testing negative on the palpation for segmental tenderness, the likelihood ratio was 0.08, and the post-test probability of a diagnosis of facet joint pain decreased to only 5%. So let's summarize. Potential screening tests prior to referring a patient for facet joint blocks include the manual spinal exam and the palpation for segmental tenderness tests based on their high sensitivity and associated low likelihood ratios. The lowest likelihood ratio was associated with the palpation for segmental tenderness test. So some questions. Why does extension and rotation not prove to be a sensitive or specific test for facet pain? It mechanically makes sense that compression of the facet joint with this positioning should increase pain. This might be an example, though, that simple anatomical and biomechanical inference is not always clinically true. Other questions are, what type of care was given to patients in this study prior to referral? In particular, were patients treated with manipulation prior to being referred for nerve blocks? If not, wouldn't it seem obvious that prior to sending patients for medical procedures that a trial of manipulation be used first? There is good basic science evidence that manipulation has its most direct effect at the facet joint, so it would seem to be the treatment of choice prior to invasive procedures. But what if manipulation was used for patients who had failed conservative care in the study and were then referred for facet blocks? Well then, this study indicates for us that for patients who fail our trial of manipulation, using the three tests of palpation for segmental tenderness, the manual spinal exam, and extension rotation, are useful in determining whether the facet is likely the source of pain, and the need for more testing and a different treatment approach that might include a nerve block. What is needed is research that indicates a comparison between facet joint blocks and manipulation in a randomized controlled study. Also, a long-term follow-up to determine the lasting effects of either. The literature does indicate that, on average, pain relief from blocks and neurotomy lasts for several months to one year and then may need to be repeated. 
Another procedure you may hear about different from neurotomy is pulsed radiofrequency of the dorsal root ganglion. Used more commonly for lumbar-related pain, this approach has not shown clinically meaningful differences when compared to placebo.